Are you, like Peter Mandelson once famously said, intensely relaxed about people <laughs> getting filthy rich? We're a country of great wealth. We need to be supportive of success. But is there a social cost? The message from the voting public is enough. In the late 1970s, we were economically struggling as a nation, but relatively equal as a people. That changed in the 1980s. Don't cut down the tall poppies. Let them rather grow tall. Margaret Thatcher's government cut taxes on the rich and made benefits less generous, as the Conservatives sought to encourage entrepreneurship and unleash market forces. I have made a fortune, and that's what I want. This is Cambridge, which statistics tell us is the most unequal city in the most unequal country in the whole of Western Europe. Cambridge has leveraged the brain power that flows from its ancient university to become a super productive software and biotechnology hub, Silicon Fen, full of highly paid workers. Scott White is a serial entrepreneur and boss of a technology startup on Cambridge's Science Park. It's continually growing and uh, probably at an accelerating rate, I think, you know, as uh, you've got some of the global trends around digitization and, and so forth, all allow things to move more and more quickly. There's always been, certainly for as long as I've been in Cambridge for the last 20 years, you know, a good base of tech entrepreneurship. It did at one point, I think, have the, the highest number of startups, you know, of, of sort of anywhere in Europe. So there is that good base there, but that tends to gain its own momentum. Yet not everyone has shared in that prosperity. On this side of the tracks is the heart of Silicon Fen, the super productive and wealthy tech hub. But on the other side of the tracks, just metres away, is the poorest ward in the city, a place where life expectancy is a full 10 years lower than it is in the richest parts of town. I found one Cambridge biotech executive who also volunteers at the city's increasingly busy food bank. You've got this great science park, booming new Absolutely. companies, and yet just, just metres away, mm -hmm. you've got this area of relative deprivation. Yes. That's the danger, isn't it? The sort of the two Cambridges yep. in that Absolutely. sense. Absolutely, two Cambridges, and um, the, they never meet. You know, there's, there's, there aren't many chances for those two kind of worlds to meet. Yeah. I think there's a whole kind of, you know, um, Cambridge has an amazing tech boom and that's the bit that you see advertised and that's kind of what you want to mm. advertise about Cambridge. Um, but it might be leaving some people behind. As inequality in Cambridge has grown over the years, so it has too in the wider country. The most widely used measure of income inequality is called the Gini coefficient. It compares everybody's income at every level of society in a single statistic. In the 1980s, this measure showed one of the most dramatic rises of any developed nation in history. It's been broadly stable since 1990, which some cite as a social success. But something else has happened. The share of income flowing to the top 1% also shot up in the 80s. But this continued to rise through the 1990s and the 2000s. In fact, the top 1% post-tax income share of adults, as measured from tax records, is close to its highest level since the 1930s. For a long time, through the economic boom years of the 1990s and 2000s, this inequality seemed to be accepted. But now, some opinion polls do hint at a desire for change, and there is widespread concern about the gap between the very richest and the rest. 80% of the public think that the gap between those with high incomes and low incomes is too large. And a larger proportion of the public want taxes to rise to fund better public services than the proportion who want taxes to stay the same. I think the financial crisis played a part. Once your income stops going up, then you mind much more if you see that some people have a lot more than you do. And it also has corrosive social and political effects, the kind of extreme inequality that we have seen since the mid or late 1980s, when some people just remove themselves from 
the life that everybody else around them leads and live in, a, a, in effect a ward garden, different schools, different places, not travelling on public transport and so on. And that I think is part of the political polarisation that we have seen. I did come across one banker uh, during the, the crisis who was determined to receive a very high salary. But when you asked why, it was because he wanted not the money to spend, he wanted what he thought was the social cachet from being known as the person with the highest salary. It looks to me the message from the voting public is enough, which is a big, if it's true, and it's beginning to look like it the more we see these surveys showing the same thing, it's a big change. I think it's got to be the first time in 20 years we've seen a, more than one opinion poll showing that actually the British appetite to pay higher taxes seems to be changing. Labour's shadow chancellor says he will introduce higher taxes on the wealthy and argues it might ultimately be accepted even among those who will pay more. I meet all these asset managers in the City of London and we're on largely on the same page. I say, look, what we're going to do as a government, our whole strategy will be invest to grow so you'll get a decent rate of return, but we're not going to be ripped off anymore. And people accept that. But also I say to them, we will have a fair taxation system and you will be paying a bit more. And the reason for that is because we want to make sure our public service is properly funded. And it's interesting in the reaction, no one likes paying tax. But the interest in the reaction is, no one likes, even if they're the richest person, you don't want to be stepping over homeless people when you come out of your office. Back to Cambridge, and a trip on one of the city's famous punts. I think we all belong in this city. Andy Smith is a porter in one of the university's colleges. Surprisingly, this is the first time I've actually been punting. Wow. <laughs> it's just not a sign of Cambridge I normally come to, to be quite honest with you. And he first moved to Cambridge back in 1980. Did it feel a more equal place then? Yeah, I think it did. Yeah, I used to dine out a lot more then than what I do now. Mm. Well, the working class man is never going to be rich, is he? But he should be able to live a better life than what some of them are living. Mm. You know, I'm quite fortunate, I think, that I'm just sort of on the balance. But there's a lot of people below me that are struggling. And some of them are working a lot of hours as well. And yet they're still struggling because they're only paid minimum wage. And it's all these restaurants and that that are feeding all these rich people mm. and the people working in them mm. are on minimum wage. Mm. It's quite easy to live in a bubble of this city. If you just looked at these buildings and you stayed here all the time, you wouldn't know what was going on on the other side of Cambridge. Mm. But, you know, we've got <clears throat> poverty in, on the social housing estates in Cambridge. There isn't enough social housing in Cambridge. And even where we're living now, they actually want to take away the social housing and, and put in some shared ownership apartments. And that's in the centre of Cambridge? That's just down the bottom of Mill Road. The truth is, Cambridge is unusually unequal, not because it's got high levels of poverty. There are cities in the UK with far worse rates of deprivation. No, Cambridge is so unequal mainly because it's economically successful. All those smart people, the scientific innovation, the investment, this has stretched the gap between the richest and the rest. Is there a danger that if we try to drastically reduce inequality here in Cambridge through higher taxation and more redistribution, that we'd end up making the city more equal but also poorer? Would that really help the least well-off here? Some say that's a dilemma that also exists on a national level. Globalisation has drastically increased the incomes of the top 1% of 1%. Uh, people like Roger Federer, the best example, he earns tens of millions of pounds a year through endorsements as well as his winnings. That's because there's a global television audience. But that same phenomenon also applies to lawyers and bankers and other people who compete in the global labour market. They have benefited enormously from this. Now, I, it's very hard to, I don't think you can stop them benefiting from that. You can certainly impose a tax rate at a reasonable level. Ours is 45%. If we had much more than that, they wouldn't be here or they'd engage in tax avoidance schemes, which means that we wouldn't get much extra money. Higher taxes just choke economic growth because the more money people are able to keep, the more money companies are able to retain, that's more money to invest in new equipment, training. It's more... It's more ability for people to you know, buy a new car or go on holiday, all of those things. So money that is taken in taxes is money that can't be spent investing in the broader economy. 
But is it true that if we raise taxes, economic growth will slow down? Top marginal income tax rates in Western countries were higher in the past without seeming to damage growth. And some economists have even begun to argue that lower inequality and more redistribution could spur faster growth. But the conventional wisdom of there being a trade-off between equality and rising prosperity is something of a myth. The view of these economists is that high inequality tends to harm investment, education and social mobility, and thus the wider economy. Yet this is far from universally accepted. And perhaps we shouldn't take those polls showing a desire for more tax and redistribution at face value. If you ask people, would you like better public services for you and your family, but someone else will pay higher taxes to pay for it, the answer is bound to be yes. And the idea that there is a group of people in Britain to whom we could turn and impose higher taxes and use that as the basis for improving our public services is simply false. That can only be done by all of us paying more taxes. And I think that needs to be understood. Uh, it's not, there's no free lunch here. Does inequality matter less if we have greater social mobility? Some insist that's where our focus should be. Are you, like Peter Mandelson once famously said, intensely relaxed about people <laughs> getting filthy rich? I'm not sure I would use those words, but I do think that we need to be supportive of success. In Britain, I worry there's a bit of a tall poppy syndrome that sometimes if somebody does well, that's, you know, there are snide remarks about them. I don't think we should be like that. I think we should celebrate success, but we should also help those people who aren't successful get the support they need to help them achieve in the future. In making this series of films about the future of the UK economy, I've spoken to lots of people around the country and there's been a perhaps surprising degree of agreement about where we need to go in terms of the world of work and regional rebalancing. To that extent, perhaps we can see the outline of a new consensus to replace the one that emerged 40 years ago. But when it comes to the future of tax and redistribution, there's much less agreement. Those old ideological divides about the size of the state and the role of the state seem to remain. 